okay so there are a few facts for you to remember in it okay so the top performing state or the top performing largest state in the world for state of food safety index is first rank is obtained by kerala followed by punjab and the third rank is obtained by the state of tamil nadu okay on the category of smaller states on the category of smaller state goa is the state which has obtained first rank followed by manipur and sikkim on the category of union territories it is jammu and kashmir followed by delhi and chandigarh please go through this particular fact you might get any one state or one category state okay so kerala goa and jammu and kashmir please remember that alone is possible okay there is also one another campaign called as eat right campaign or eat right challenge which are a challenge for various districts in tamil nadu so phase 2 of this particular challenge was re- released so there is one category called as exceptional category out of the e trade challenge campaign in the exceptional category many districts located in the state of tamil nadu madhya pradesh and west bengal scored a lot so out of the total 260 participating districts 31 districts achieved a score of 75% or higher which is under the category called good okay so exceptional categories most of the districts from the state of tamil nadu madhya pradesh west bengal uttar pradesh and maharashtra scored under this exceptional category okay so the next topic or the 15th topic which we will be seeing for the day is indian navy has commemorated the 130th anniversary of gandhi's satyagraha at a place where it began so we all know that mahatma gandhi went to south africa and also fought for a cause called as cause called as apartheid in south africa so there is one incident called as peter marksburg railway station incident which most of you might be knowing if not so mahatma gandhi when he was traveling from durban to uh, some in a train in south africa and peter marksburg so he had a first class ticket he was pulled down by the ticket taker you know in a way stating that he is not supposed to travel in that particular compartment so he had a ticket so it was one sort of racial discrimination so the day was 7th june 9 sorry 1893 gandhi he actually started a struggle against the apartheid which was prevailing in south africa at a railway station called as st peter marksburg near durban okay so indian navy will commemorate this particular incident of which happened exactly 130 years ago so the historical significance is we'll know what was that one particular trigger point which made gandhi start the ideology of satyagraha okay this event also acknowledged the diplomatic relations for starting of diplomatic relations of 30 years between india and south africa india and south africa two countries actually started their diplomatic relations since 22nd november 1993 okay so 1992 is the year which we actually started having our diplomatic relationship with israel do india recognize israel as a country in 1949 first for the first time after 1991 something happened called as liberalization privatization globalization and after that 1992 india started formally having a diplomatic relationship with a country called as israel and in the year 1993 india started having its diplomatic relationship with the country called as south africa this is for your information okay so on this particular occasion one particular indian naval ship called as ins trishul ins trishul a front line warship took part in this particular event showcasing the intersection of history and international cooperation history 1893 mahatma gandhi had the satyagraha in a country called as south africa international cooperation since the year 1993 between india and south africa formally okay so ins trishul also signifies the event of azadi ka amrit mahotsav visit okay this is one of the key moments in india's independence struggle under the azadi ka amrit mahotsav so please keep this particular thing also in mind so the next article or the 16th article which will we will be seeing is doctors may soon diagnose a peptic ulcer a disease stage by recognizing breath pattern okay so what is a peptic ulcer peptic ulcer is nothing but the ulcer which is present in your stomach okay so usually there is some other diagnosing technique 
to identify peptic ulcer but scientists have now come up with a non invasive so here you will have to find the, or know the difference between invasive versus non invasive invasive versus non invasive non invasive gastric disorder diagnosis method this is a new method which is been developed by professor manik pradhan's research team at sn bose national center at sn bose national center okay so professor manik pradhan's research team at sn bose national center they have come up with a non invasive gastric disorder diagnosis method okay so the name of this method is called as pyro breath pyro breath meaning from the breath samples itself they will get to know the type of ulcer find in the human body so it is a non invasive technique so what is an invasive and a non invasive technique invasive technique is like something is injected into your body either through a needle or a medicine is injected to your body or an instrument is injected to your body to diagnose your particular no issue or your complications here it is a non invasive technique meaning from just your breath pattern this particular diagnosis of peptic ulcer or any other sort of gastric conditions any other sort of gastric conditions can be detected okay so it also uses a technique called as machine learning <coughs> machine learning is one of an artificial intelligence technique where it will detect breath samples and extract information from large breathomics data sets leading to the identification of unique breath pattern so it will identify a unique breath pattern and it will categorize what is the type or category of peptic ulcer which you are having okay so the next art article which we will be seeing or the 17th article which we will be seeing is sagar samriddhi okay sagar samriddhi it is a bridging monitoring system it is a online bridging monitoring system okay recently union minister of for ports shipping and waterways launched an online bridging monitoring monitoring system so now we have to know what bridging is so dredging is a removal of sediments and debris meaning dredging is a removal of sediments and debris from the bottoms of lakes rivers harbors and other water bodies why is it needed sir why is it needed because only then the capacity of that particular lake or river will be good enough to you know carry the flow of the water if there is a lot of accumulation of debris or any other sediment then the water holding capacity of that particular body of lake or river will drastically reduce so it is a routine necessity for waterways around the world because sedimentation which is a natural process of sand and silt will wash the channels and harbors okay it will drastically reduce the water holding capacity of harbors and channels okay this system this particular sagar samriddhi system the body which developed it, this particular data you will have to know for the perspective of your preliminary examination okay so it was developed by national technology center for ports waterways and coast the name of the organization is national technology center for ports waterways and coast it is a technological arm of this particular union ministry called as ministry of ports shipping and waterways so this particular technological arm developed this particular no bridging monitoring system so it will monitor the projects which are taken in different parts of the country which are to be taken in the different parts of the country and the project are, which is also happening in the countries at right now okay might as well it will also come up with a multiple reports like daily bridging report pre and post bridging survey data before and processing a data on the real time basis okay so they will also come up with the different reports called as daily dredging report pre dredging report and post dredging report survey so this we will have to keep in mind so the next particular topic of the 18th article which we will be seeing is made in india trans uae maritime partnership exercise so maritime partnership exercise is nothing but a navy exercise which is done between three countries called as india trans and UAE United Arab Emirates is one country in your Arabian Peninsula see we have bilateral exercises separately between India and France Indian friends please write down in the comment section what are all the bilateral army navy 
and air force exercises between india and france separately and also write down what are all the bilateral exercises between india and uae separately okay bilateral exercise between india and uae separately i'll give you a idea the bilateral exercise of india and france air forces garuda exercise garuda okay exercise garuda is a bilateral exercise between india and france air force okay so this particular data says recently india france and uae participated in the first ever or a major trilateral maritime exercise in the gulf of oman where gulf of oman please refer to your to your map to find out where gulf of oman is and what is that particular strait which separates iran with the country called as oman okay please get to know or have do a homework of what is that particular state or sorry state which separates the country called as iran and oman okay so from india side indian naval ship tarkash indian naval ship tarkash participated in this trilateral naval exercise and from the french side french ship called as turkoff and french rafale aircraft these both people participated in the first ever naval exercises meaning two vessel one vessel and one aircraft from the french side one indian naval ship from the indian side and uae naval maritime patrol vessel participated in the exercises okay so what the names of the ship is ins tarkash french naval ship sorkov and french rafale aircraft might as well uae navy's maritime patrol aircraft okay here it is already mentioned what are all the bilateral exercises between india and france so for army it is exercise shakti for navy it is exercise varuna and for air force it is exercise garuda okay so there are few other bilateral relationship or military relationship between india and france we know that recently india purchased 36 rafale fighter jets from france might also there is a total of 6 scorpion class submarine recently just now we saw a tar- torpedo called as varnashtra which can be fired from a vessel or a submarine so there is also an agreement between india and france to manufacture six scorpion class submarine with technology transfer from france france country gives us technology with which india will manufacture six scorpion class submarines and recently you also know that there was this 36 rafale fighter jet which was also you know purchased by india from france okay so uae also we have one exercise called as exercise desert eagle it is a combat exercise a training exercise to be conducted in desert warfare okay so this particular exercise we are already having with uae also so recently this is the first ever time or a maiden occasion where india france and uae together participated in the maritime partnership exercise so the next article which we are going to see or the 19th article which we are going to see is the nutri garden project okay so this particular nutri garden project was introduced by prime minister narendra modi in lakshadweep okay recently for various other reasons for the reasons of maldives lakshadweep is in news and for one another reason in the month of june 2023 lakshadweep was all again in news because prime minister narendra modi appreciated the nutri garden project which was taking place in lakshadweep island okay so the project was launched with the object of self reliant india with the object of self reliant india in which vegetable seed in which vegetable seed was provided for 1000 farmers in your lakshadweep island okay vegetable seeds were provided along with it 7000 chickens of indigenous breeds were distributed to the women of lakshadweep with which they can have poultry farming in the backyard of their houses 7000 chickens were provided might as well vegetable seeds were provided okay so the purpose of this project is to support every rural poor household to have an agri nutri garden to have an agri nutri garden to fulfill the nutrition of every rural household family okay so the in line with prime minister's vision of enhancing strength of rural economy and his call for atmanirbhar bharat rural india the object of the scheme is to have 78 lakh nutri gardens or agri nutri gardens to 
which will ensure food and nutritional security in our rural india see the call of prime minister is atmanirbhar bharat meaning self reliant india so this particular project objective is also to have 78 lakh agri nutri gardens which will ensure food and nutritional security okay so the major purpose is to raise nutritional awareness and education might as well behavioral change in rural areas the main focus of this particular nutri garden project is rural areas so what we have to keep in mind is nutri gardens in lakshadweep islands by prime minister narendra modi the target is rural community so two things which are provided is vegetable seed might as well chickens for the promotion of poultry farming on the backyards of the households of rural india so the next article or the 20th article which we will be seeing for today is astronomers have spot a surprising solar eruption that maintains constant temperature so here we have to know what a solar eruption is we all know we all belong to a family called as solar family where sun is at the center and all planets revolve around the sun in various or its own orbits okay so time and again like we earth is having an volcanic eruption the sun or the solar is also having a solar eruption where it was previously thought that at one particular place called as corona so before that we all know the earth a part of earth is made up of crust the outer layer is called as crust the inner layer is called as mantle or and the center or the central layer is called as core the same way for the sun there are different layers the center of the sun is called as core the center of the sun is called as core and the outer layer or the next layer of the sun is called as photosphere and the third layer of the sun is called as chromosphere and the atmosphere of the sun is called as corona okay the atmosphere of the sun is called as corona it is from this chromosphere and corona there were a continuous solar you know emissions or eruptions which were detected but recently scientists have tracked the continuous evolution of solar eruption energy state focusing on the core behavior usually a solar eruption happens and slowly after the eruption that one particular point where the eruption has started that particular point temperature of that particular point tends to cool down but here recently in the recent you know observation scientists have found out that the part, particular temperature from where or the particular point from where the eruption is happening the temperature has been maintained constantly that is what is the article which is in the news okay the place actually maintains a constant temperature so first we will know what is a coronal mass ejection these are large scale eruptions of charged particles charged particles in magnetic fields from the solar atmosphere into space so when the eruption happens or when the solar you know storms happen a large amount of charged particles are emitted and those charged ions or particles which are emitted from the sun they will come and interfere into the functioning of various satellites or any other communication systems present in the outer space in the space or the outer space of the earth so it will in a way you know result into a disturbance of the communication or any other satellite system okay so that is what your next point is talking about so they can dis- disrupt a range of ground and space based technologies ground and space See, we have an international space station at a distance of 400 km we have a number of communication satellite in orbit also so all those satellites or any other space based technologies can be disrupted because of this coronal mass ejection okay so that is why it is crucial to understand us why is this phenomenon of coronal mass ejection from corona is happening and what is what are its consequences and what are the causes for it to, ha- it to happen all these things are important for us to know okay so it is important for us to study the thermodynamic properties of every coronal mass ejection okay so the physical properties may be the same and sorry the chemical properties may be the same but the physical properties of every coronal mass ejection may change so it will also help us to monitor the space weather we also not we also should not only monitor the weather of or the atmosphere of the earth alone we also need to monitor the weather of the space also because there are the number of factors a plasma a, you know a charged ion or any other charged particle or mass ejection can interfere with the earth atmosphere from the space it can interfere with the earth atmosphere 
so there are usually it was believed that there will be a variation in temperature when the charged plasma is being emitted but recently scientists from the institution called as aryabhatta research institute of observational sciences the name of the institution is airy scientists from aryabhatta research institute of observational sciences have found out that the coronal mass ejection core the core of that particular ejection maintained a constant temperature this you might find in the statement so there will the statement might say that there will be a variation in the temperature in every occasion no here in this particular case they have maintained the constant temperature during propagation which is contrary to the ex- expected adiabatic cooling meaning when once when the you know ejection is done when the mass ejection is done it it was believed by the scientists that immediately the core used to cool down but here it used to may it has maintained the constant temperature so that is one change which we have to keep in mind okay so the next article or the 21st article which we will be seeing is indo maldives joint military exercise the maldives is very important because time and again jan 2020 also maldives is in use for various reasons but now the tension between india and maldives are in a friction point but usually india and maldives used to have a very friendly relation we have a joint military exercise called as exercise equivarine the name of the exercise is equivarine so as of now we have seen a number of exercises between india and france we have seen three exercises for army navy and air force and between india and india. UAE also we saw an exercise called as exercise desert eagle so now we are going to see an another military exercise so please write down in the comment section what are all the military exercises between india and nepal india and sri lanka and india and mongolia might as well india and usa also please write down in the comment section the military or the joint military exercises conducted between india and all of these four countries sri lanka nepal mongolia and united states of america okay so here the military exercises or the joint bilateral military exercise between india and maldives is called as exercise equivarin so the 12th edition the 12th edition of this exercise took place in uttarakhand in the indian state of uttarakhand this might be a factual question for you so this particular 12th edition of exercises exercise between india and maldives took place in uttarakhand from june 11th to 24th from june 11th to 24th okay so there is one fact here meaning the meaning for the word equivalent is friends meaning it symbolizes that india and maldives are two friendly ra- nations which are you know every year conducting an bilateral annual military exercise so usually it is a 14 day exercise it is a 14 day exercise in which they you know combat or you know unitedly operate on various fields to combat you know terrorism operations to enhance interoperability say for example if there is any hostile situation in the indian ocean region how can these two particular countries called as india and maldives come together and you know have an interoperability so that they can counter insurgency or terrorism activities which are operating in the area okay might as well along with this two objectives they also focused on joint humanitarian assistance say for example if there is any sort of natural calamity or the man made calamity how a joint humanitarian assistance can be given and a disaster relief operation can be given was also a key focus of this particular 12th edition of joint military exercise called as equivarin between india and maldives okay so this particular exercise is also is actually a testament to their close and friendly relations as of now as i told earlier there is a fictional relationship between india and maldives very recently because of the provocative tweets which were been made by the members of parliament of maldives but historically we have had a friendly relationship so the next particular article or the 22nd article which we will be seeing is the indian drugs controller called as central drugs standards control organization the name of the body is central drugs standards control organization under the ministry of health and family welfare under the ministry of health and family welfare okay 
they have approved first indigenously developed animal tissue derived engineering called as scaffold so the name of this particular technology or object is called as scaffold usually scaffold means that one particular vertical rod which is used in construction activities during the construction of houses or any other buildings you will be you seeing vertical structures which are placed so this scaffold has some other property to cure skin related issues skin related scars or any other wounds okay it is an animal derived technology and it has got its approval from this particular body called as central drugs standard control organization which is a body under the ministry of health and family welfare so okay so this first indigenously developed tissue engineering scaffold from mammalian organs it is a class b biomedical device so this particular device called as scaffold is categorized as class b so there is also which conveys that there is also class a b and c so it is a class d bio medical device which have recently received approval approval from the indian drugs controller okay so which is that one particular body which actually developed this particular device is the name of the body is sri chitra tirunal institute sri chitra tirunal institute of medical sciences and technology tiruvananthapuram kerala that is a body or an organization which has actually developed this particular device okay so and it has now got an approval from this central drugs standard control organization government of india okay so this particular device is actually developed from the pig's gall bladder this particular device is actually developed and curated from the pig's gall bladder which is called as clodum clodum the name of this particular scaffold is called as clodum which when you know injected into a human a human epidermis when an injured injury or a wound or a scar is there it will in a way curate that particular wound or injury which are caused because of burn or any other diabetic wound in the epidermis of the skin okay so might as well they are also developing or they are also trying to develop one another gel an in injectable gel which they will be using for the application purpose and that particular wounded site that this particular uh scaffold called as called as clodum can be used okay uh, so here a number of data is given so with the invention of this or with the you know development of this particular scaffold called as clodum the cost of treatment of any particular wound or any particular injury because of burns can go down from 10000 rupees to 2000 rupees which is a drastic reduction in the cost or expenditure incurred for the treatment of any particular skin wound so the next particular topic or the 23rd topic which we will be seeing is called as this one particular body called as geological survey of india training institute the name of the body is geological survey of india training institute which is located in hyderabad has called has got an accreditation called as ati uttam okay the body the name of the body is geological survey of india training institute it has got an accreditation called as ati uttam okay so which is an one particular organization which has got this particular you know accreditation of adi utam you will have to keep in mind you will have to be able to find that particular body or organization in your options provided in your question so and also please get to know that this particular organization called as geological survey of india is under the ministry of mines and in, under the union government of india okay under the union government of india so what sir is the body which gave this particular accreditation to the geological survey of india is this particular body called as national accreditation board of education and training this particular body called as national accreditation board of education and training please also write in comment section which is that organization which a body called as nac gives accreditation to okay we also have something called as nac accreditation which also gives accreditation to various other institutions please write in the comment section for what organizations or institution this particular body called as nac gives accreditation to okay so this particular accreditation is based on 
a rigorous inspection which is done and which will also highlight the institute's adherence to the high standards in its standard operating procedures called as SOPs standard operating procedures so after a rigorous inspection this particular accreditation called as ATHI UTAM is given okay so now we have a few factual data to know about this one particular organization called as Ge Geological Sur Survey of India okay so this particular body was established in the year 1976 it was established in the year 1976 and is headquartered in Hyderabad, it is headquartered in Hyderabad and it has it comprises of six regional offices, six regional training divisions plus four field training centers. So, six regional training divisions plus four field training uh, centers. This also a uh, factual data, please keep in mind you might have it in your statements. Okay, so this particular body, as I told earlier, it is under the Ministry of Mines. Okay, so there are a few other data which you have to know which is provided here which you might use for your mains answer writing okay this particular body also collaborates with organization like mineral exploration and you know collection collections limited oil and national gas corporation and national mines development corporation so these are the few bodies with which your geological survey of india functions so please go through the data of international engagement and course offering which are provided by the geological survey of india and the training institute okay so it, it also gives no, training not only to indian citizens or indian students it also gives training to foreign nationals also through the program called as indian technological and economic cooperation indian technological and economic cooperation which is under the ministry of external affairs under the ministry of external affairs okay so it also gives training to foreign nationals also please that is one data which you have to keep in mind where you might also think that these particular body gives training only for indian citizens no it is not the case it gives the training for foreign nationals also so the next particular article or the 24th article which we will be seeing for the day is sovereign gold bond scheme so we have to know what is the meaning for the word bond bond is a debt instrument bond it is a debt instrument what is a debt instrument? Debt instrument are those instruments which are provided for the sake of raising money or any other capital investment. So, what happened is from the year 2015 onwards itself, the government of India along with the help of Reserve Bank of India started coming up with this sovereign gold bond scheme. Okay. What are, what is a sovereign gold, gold bond scheme is a, it is a government security. Sovereign gold bond is a government security which is a substitute for holding physical gold. See, Indians have the habit of investing a portion of their savings in gold in the form of a jewellery. But this particular sovereign gold bond is actually, a, is actually a substitute for holding physical gold and this particular bond is issued at a price in which can be bought in a cash and these bonds can be redeemed in again in cash on the date of a maturity. A maturity period can be 1 or 3 or 5 years. So, on the date of maturity, you can again redeem this particular bond in cash itself, not necessarily in gold. Okay. So, the issuer of this bond is RBI, Reserve Bank of India is the issuer of this particular bond. So, that is one particular data you will have to keep in mind. So, this is now the second series. As I told earlier, the first series was issued in the year 2015 for a period of 8 years. First series for a period of 8 years. Now, in 2023 and 2024 financial year, second series are being issued again for a period of 8 years. So, the body or the authority which issues this particular bond is called as Reserve Bank of India. Okay. So, here in this particular tabular column, there are a number of data for which you will have to go through. As I told earlier, issuance, this particular sovereign gold bond is issued by a body called as Reserve Bank of India, RBI, on behalf of the government of India. So, the, there is an eligibility for who can purchase this particular sovereign gold bond? So, the eligibility is like this. So, it is restricted to resident individuals, any individual and any citizen of country like you and me. Also, Hindu undivided families, any family which are registered under this Hindu Marriage Act, a Hindu undivided family are also eligible to buy this sovereign gold bonds. Trust or universities or any other charitable institution. Okay. So, there are different criteria. Uh, or different ceiling levels of how much gold bond you can purchase for all of these various categories. Okay, so the next tenure, the next uh, point is the tenure of 
how long this particular bond is issued so the tenure of the sovereign gold bond will be for a period of 8 years and you will also have an option of premature selling or redemption of this point this particular bond after a period of 5 years so you can sell this bond after the completion of 5 year also or you can hold this bond for a complete period of 8 years which is the maturity period of this particular sovereign gold bond so what is the minimum and maximum limit of for which you can buy a bond is the minimum limit is will be 1 gram of gold 1 gram of gold for any sort of resident individuals and the maximum limit will be 4 kg minimum limit 1 gram of gold and maximum limit is 4 kg for a individual and also 4 kg for an hindu undivided family for individual plus hindu undivided family the maximum limit is 4 kg so for trust for any trust it is called, it is a maximum limit of 20 kg okay so in case of a joint holder so this is one exception in case of a joint holder meaning you and any other person are purchasing this particular sovereign gold bond for the first person or the first applicant the maximum limit will be 4 kg and for the second applicant if it is in case of a joint holder the maximum limit will be up to 20 kg so this one particular fact you please keep in mind okay so what are all the sales channel any scheduled commercial banks any scheduled commercial banks which are not a small finance bank or a payment bank or a regional rural bank again in your economics you should have come across what is a small finance bank what is a payment bank and what is a regional rural bank so these banks or any scheduled commercial bank can sell this particular sovereign gold bonds along with this national stock exchange and bombay stock exchange and clearing corporation of india so these bodies and all these you might find in statement or for your knowledge and or for your understanding please get to know what are all those bodies which can sell or issue this particular sovereign gold bond any scheduled commercial bank clearing corporation of india national stock exchange bombay stock exchange these are the bodies or organizations which can issue this bond so the next uh, point which you have to keep in mind is the interest rate is 2.5% per annum on which this particular bond is issued okay and this particular bond can also be used as a collateral for obtaining loans from banks okay this particular bond can also be obtained for getting gold from banks okay please get to know this you might find in statement the first sovereign gold bond scheme was launched by government in november 2015 i have already told this earlier time and again i am repeating please remember it was released for the first time in 2015 under gold monetization scheme under gold monetization scheme and the second phase of issuance is 2023 exactly after 8 years of maturity period okay 8 years of maturity period okay so what are what are those particular organization which will decide the rate or the price of this particular gold bond for every single gram is this particular body indian bullion and jewelers association limited indian bullion and jewelers association limited is that one particular organization which will decide the rate or the price of 1 gram of gold bond or a bond sovereign gold bond which is worth 1 gram okay so this particular body there are some tax or prelims oriented tax provided in this particular document again as i have told you already this particular document is available in your descriptive in your description please download it and have the file along with you as you see the video so this particular organization was established in the year 1919 as an association for bullion traders so as an association for bullion traders please go through all other data provided in this particular link so please know the building or the headquarters of this association is located at zaveri bazar in mumbai it is headquartered in mumbai the name of the association which decides or fixes the price is called as indian bullion and jewelers association located in mumbai okay so the next article or the 25th article which we will be seeing right now is union minister of education flags of gabon's first agro economic zone okay so gabon is one country please remember gabon is one country in the northern africa on the southern part of your saharan desert gabon is an african country okay so union minister for education is sri dharmendra prasad actually flagged off gabon's first agro sorry agri special economic zone see africa is one country which is you know time and again facing this food insecurity or food shortage so all of these countries have come together for working 
on various fronts along with india even after india hosting this last g20 summit there are a number of developments made by india after that so please know so the person who a part of this particular special economic zone is sri dharmendra pradhan who is the minister for education this particular project will involve participation from 30 farmers and 20 other students who are bsc or msc graduates or btech mtech engineering students from odisha okay so from odisha because this particular centurion university is in odisha this particular centurion university along with this aom group it is a you know multinational conglomerate this particular group called as aom group along with centurion university are the one who are implementing this special economic or agri special economic zone project okay so students and other farmers from odisha state of odisha participates in this particular uh project so during this occasion sri uh, dharmendra pradhan also expressed his, his confidence that this particular special economic zone in gabon will also contribute to the food security and self sufficiency in the country india as a country also have this uh, you know ambitious uh, quote of uh, you know atmanirbhar bharat and also this particular you know the project which is uh, been implemented in gabon will also you know in a way contribute to the self sufficiency of the country okay so some factual data about this india's g20 presidency is given it also you know emphasizes you know india's role in global south south developing countries or also you know in a way of amplifying the voice of you know, underdeveloped or you know least developed countries on also global south south developing countries okay so the next particular article we will be seeing or the 26th article we will be seeing is national time release study report national time release study report so one prelims fact you will have to keep in mind is the chairman of central board of indirect taxes chairman of central board of indirect taxes released this national time release you know study report this study report is majorly focused on this you know airports and also you know seaports data where cargo from inside the country which is exported might also cargo from exported nations which are entering into india how long does it take to pass this particular cargo terminal that particular data is mentioned in this particular national time release study report which is released by the chairman of central board of indirect taxes and customs okay so there are a few data is mentioned about this particular report so it is a quantitative measurement of cargo release time it gives us the data of how much time does it take a cargo takes for moving this particular you know any port be it a sea port be it a air cargo port or be it an inland container port or be it an integrated check post so we all know sea ports where they will be located in any of the ports of india and air cargo in airport and this inter- inland container depot will be you know placed in interstate between one state to another and this integrated check post in icp called as integrated check post will be you know all along the borders of neighboring countries so say for example we have five integrated check posts between india and bangladesh petropol benapol and all or those called as integrated check posts so there are a number of highlights of this particular report mentioned in this particular file please go through the file and which are very much important for your mains perspective as of now please get to know which is that one particular body which releases this national time release study so the next particular topic we will be seeing is this vibe of fellowship program which is announced to connect indian stem diaspora indian diaspora are nothing but people of indian origin living abroad okay so this particular stem the meaning for this stem is science technology engineering mathematics and medicine so this vibe of fellowship program it is a fellowship program to you know give provide scholarship to indian students or persons of indian origin who are living abroad and who are pursuing their studies in science technology engineering mathematics and medicine okay so this particular vibe of fellowship program is launched by government of india and it is you know implemented by department of science and technology under the ministry of science and technology this is one factual data please get to know so in a way providing scholarship to these particular people of indian diaspora will in a way you know collaborate or connect indian academic institutions you know indian universities and research and development institutions 
with those people of Indian origin. Okay, it aims at it also aims at sharing knowledge and wisdom of best practices in an era of technological development in an era of technological revolution. So this particular collaboration or you know partnership between Indian universities or research and development institutions with the Indian diaspora living outside who are having their or pursuing their academics on science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. It, it has become an you know vital step to do. So it is this particular fellowship called as Vibe Fellowship. It is open to all scientists and technologists of Indian origin, meaning people of Indian origin or ethnicity living abroad, who are having this NRI, meaning non-resident Indian or overseas citizenship or citizens of India and people of Indian origin cards. Okay. So so the program actually selected seventy-five members or seventy-five fellows to work in eighteen knowledge verticals. in 18 knowledge verticals for example quantum computing or quantum technology health electronics artificial intelligence so such kind of such kind of 18 different fields are identified and out of to work in those 18 fields 75 fellows are actually been elected uh, for this vibe fellowship program so it includes a grant it includes a financial grant and might also international and domestic travel and also accommodation and also any other contingencies or allowances which are needed all these are covered in this particular vibe fellowship program so we are coming towards the last topic for the day so three states rajasthan gujarat and tamil nadu have been declared as the top achievers in the wind energy adoption so india as a country has an ambitious target of 500 gigawatt of renewable energy adoption adoption by the year of 2030 by the year of 2030 in its indc intended nationally deter nationally determined contributions see please get to know what is this intended nationally determined contributions or promises made by india for the sake of climate change please also understand that india is also having an ambitious target of generating 500 gigawatts of renewable energy be it wind energy be it uh, solar energy be it hydrothermal energy or you know hydro energy so india is having a target of five, generating 500 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by the year of 2030 so june 15th this is one prelims fact you will have to take so june 15th is celebrated as global wind day global wind day on this occasion you know in a way to educate people which explores way to power the future of india using wind energy okay global wind day on and on this occasion this celebrated to educate or to create awareness among the people to power the future of india with wind energy okay so here i have as i have told you already there is a commitment of india for 500 gigawatts of renewable energy so this particular uh, report gives us data of states which have you know recognized top positions so state achievements are recognition of top performing states like rajasthan gujarat and tamil nadu have achieved a larger amount of installed wind energy generation capacity so this particular data is given so and also there is one particular organization called as national institute of wind energy national institute of wind energy under the ministry of new and renewable energy under the ministry of new and renewable energy it has come up with the wind atlas it has come up with the wind atlas showing those areas which have an high possibility of wind energy generation above 150 meters above the ground level from the surface 150 meters until the height of 150 meters we will have this national you know you know potential for generating wind energy and this particular organization called as national institute of wind energy came up with this particular wind atlas okay so this particular day of global wind day will also have an active participation or to encourage an active active participation of central and state government authorities for the development of wind energy and india is also one of the leading global countries meaning fourth largest countries in wind power generation capacity india is the fourth largest country in wind power generation capacity and it has as of now achieved a total of 15 gigawatt capacity of wind energy generation wind energy generation aligning with its vision of atmar nirbhar bharat or self reliant india with an you know vision of atmanirbhar bharat and self reliant india please 
keep in mind the ambitious target is 50 gigawatt from all other various wind sources such as solar wind or hydro power or any other renewable sources so that is for the day thank you and we will be continuing part 2 of our june month 2023 current affairs tomorrow